I'm Miwa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over, and I am so excited for all of you to meet Brian Broom. Punch Me Up to the Gods is just out in paperback. It was, you know, it was one of those books that came out during the pandemic and not enough people saw Darnell Moore's review in the New York Times. It was a Times editor pick. It won the 2021 Kirkus Prize for Nonfiction. Brian's a columnist at the Washington Post, but this book, this book is really special. Kiese Lehman loves this book. Imani Perry loves this book. Damon Young loves this book. Disha Filia loves this book. I mean, the list goes on and on. So I am not alone in my love for this book. But Brian, can we set this up for folks who missed the book when it came out in hardcover? Because you've done something pretty cool here. You know, if I were to crystallize it into one word, I think it's about shame. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of it is about shame, about being ashamed of who you are, where you come from. Um, And the things that, you know, we do as young people, I think sometimes to mitigate that shame uh, up into and including pretending to be somebody else up into and including, you know, abuse of drugs and alcohol, um, self-loathing, you know, et cetera. I like to look at the book as a collection of cautionary tales. You know, when I first wrote it, uh, when I was writing it, I thought, I hope that like, you know, at least five other black gay people read this book so they don't do, you know, uh, the things that I did. Um, And as it has turned out, you know, those kinds of, um, you know, feelings are universal, you know, so I'm, I'm not just hearing from other black gay men, I'm hearing from, you know, everybody who has had these kinds of like feelings in their lives, um, you know, growing up and trying to find out who they are and dealing with rejection and love and, you know, and addiction and all these, all these things. So I think the book is just about, you know, coming out of all that. Um, and learning to accept who you are, which I still haven't completely done. I mean, let's not be unreasonable. Like, it's still, you know, a journey, I think, for all of us, just learning to accept, uh, you know, who you are. So I think that's kind of what the book is about, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, it totally makes sense, because I've read it twice now. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, it makes a ton of sense to me. But you're also in conversation with Gwendolyn Brooks and her poem, We Real Cool. You structured this book around that poem, which I think is really great. And at the end of the book, you do also come back with a little call out to James Baldwin letters to my nephew. Is this book in conversation with those writers? I mean, how did how did you start working on the physical structure of the story? It did not start off as being in conversation with these two great writers. What happened was, as I was writing it, they wanted in, <laughs> you know? I feel like, you know, the Gwendolyn Brooks poem, the book didn't start off as it, uh, un, underneath that structure. Um, I was in the process of writing these essays. And one day I was in the Chatham University library and I was just kind of like not really, I don't know what I was looking for, but um, I, I found the Gwendolyn Brooks poem. Like I discovered it. I thought I discovered it. I was like, you know, why is nobody talking about this poem? I had never read the poem before. Um, and as I read I the, like what, seven, eight lines of this poem, I realized like this woman in these few lines has completely distilled like what I'm talking about, like in my essay. So I feel like as I was writing it, Gwendolyn Brooks kind of reached, you know, from beyond the grave and like tapped me on the shoulder and was like, hey, I'm talking about this too. Can you use this? Would you like to use this poem? You know, so of course I immediately, you know, had to use it, not only just use it, but like structure the whole book around it. Um, Because I thought she had done such a wonderful job. I, because of the poem, I also then went and uh, read Bell Hooks, We Real Cool Black Men and Masculinity. And I was like, oh my God, these black women are are, 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 are beating me to the punch, you know, uh, you know, sort of talking about these things in these remarkable ways, yet different ways. So I feel like, you know, um, you know, like Gwendolyn Brooks kind of like asked me if she could be a part of this because she had already done this work. And of course, James Baldwin, you know, has been talking about, um, you know, blackness and, and queerness for, you know, for years, like before I was born, you know, um, and of course, you know, he had to have a say, um, you know, in the book, I was really careful about like not reading him while I was writing it because I didn't, you know, that writer fear of like, 
you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, bite in the style of another writer. Um, but I, I definitely knew he had to be a part of this book because I want this book to be a part of a conversation about blackness, about masculinity and what it is and what it isn't about femininity and what it is and what it isn't all these things that we like you know sort of invented around gender um you know I want this book to be a part of that that conversation and my life story I think plays into that conversation as a black gay man absolutely so when you talk in the book about masculinity because that really is a big piece of the beating heart of your story is masculinity, the way you're perceived by your own family, the way you're perceived by classmates and teachers, and what that means, the opportunities in some cases that it shut down for you. There were opportunities that you lost because someone decided that their homophobia was more important than your place in whatever piece of the story it was. Absolutely. You know, I, I, um, you know, this, it's this weird thing about, you know, I've come to think of people as like, and when I look at people, I think about, you know, the body that you're born into, you know, um, and how um, the world wants to place you in this category because of the body that you're born into. It doesn't necessarily have a lot to do with you, you know, um, but you know, the body that I was born into has put me into circumstances where people sort of assumed I was one thing or another, you know, um, as, you know, a black man uh, assumed to be like, you know, hyper-masculine, good, you know, smooth with the ladies or like good at sports, which is another thing that comes up or just not as smart, you know, um, as other people. Um, that has definitely uh, uh, come up in my life like many, many times. And I, and I write about it. Let's go to the spelling bee story for a second. <laughs> okay. I mean, and for anyone who's read Long Division by Kiese Lennon, which is a novel I happen to love, this wouldn't be the first time, obviously, that shenanigans have happened, <laughs> fictional or not, at a spelling right. bee. With a black boy, though, specifically, because there is a perception that, in fact, you're not smart, but would you tell that story here? I think it's an important piece for you. Yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, I think I was, I was sixth grade. Um, I accidentally ended up in the spelling bee. I say accidentally because, you know, I just could spell. Like I was just really good at it. And I, and it wasn't anything that I worked at, you know, I would just see a word and it would just line itself up in my head and it would just be there forever, you know? And so we had these spelling bees in the classroom and I didn't know that they were going to turn into something bigger. Like each time I won one in the classroom, that it was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I ended up, you know, being in the school wide spelling bee. It's very strange. It didn't compute to a lot of people that a black boy was in this was spelling, you know, um, in where I grew up and in the time that I grew up, if you were a black boy, your job was to be cool and to do sports. Um, and I couldn't do either one of those, right? And so the spelling bee story is just sort of my tale of like, just how that all unfolded and all the things that I, I felt, you know, at the time, you know, um, even, I mean, as I say, you know, it was from both sides, you know, and in my school, it was only black and white, you know, uh, and from black kids, I felt this, I, this, this feeling of like, I was somehow betraying my race and gender by being, you know, in the spelling bee and from white kids, it was just confusion. And, you know, um, which I think somehow trans, which I think translates today is like, you know, I think about uh, Justice Katanji uh, Brown Jackson and how her intelligence is questioned, you know, which I think is a thing that black people go through a lot, you know, our bodies, we like people don't question our bodies, like in terms of like sports and things like that, you know, like basketball, football or whatever, like, you know, nobody questions that, but it, but we, we are always seem to be under this level of suspicion with regard to our intelligence. Are we as smart as, you know, um, and that's the whole thing that I kind of went through, like with the spelling bee, you know, even my teacher, you know, would accuse me of cheating, you know, this, this woman who, was convinced that I was cheating, you know, on like the essays that I used to write essays. I used to take my homework back home and like 
look up words, and use a thesaurus. And like, you know, she was, she wasn't curious at all about how I did that. It was just automatically that I must have been cheating. Um, and that's what the spelling bee story is about. I won't tell you how it ends, um, but um, it was definitely a defining moment in my life. I learned something about the way the world viewed me um, at that time, you know, during that spelling bee. I learned a lot of things about what Black people expected me to be, what white people expected me to be, and what the world at large, I think, expected me to be, and I wasn't it. And I think that that was the beginning of me trying to just change to make everybody comfortable with my, the body that I was born into. How old were you? Um, it was sixth grade. So I don't know how old are you in sixth grade? 11, like 12? Yeah, yeah, 11, 12. Yeah. You're little. You're a mm -hmm. kid. You're a mm -hmm. kid and you're making decisions about who you are as a person because other people are ascribing their values and their impressions and their ideas on your body. Absolutely. I think, but I think that, um, you know, uh, women and girls go through that mm -hmm. immediately, mm -hmm. you know, so I don't think it, it's definite. it's not unique in general, but the things that I went for were, I think, unique to being a black and, and male at that time. Well, and I think too, I mean, we're talking about Ohio in the eighties, oh, yeah. your dad has been laid off. He's having a rough go of things. He does not have the support services that he probably needed looking yeah. back on things. Your mom is working, your brother and sister and you are all in school and you're trying to figure out how to move forward. Yeah. You did not have the magical moment where someone gave you a scholarship to a fancy school and you were transported out. And in fact, when you got to college, you had terrible roommates and you ran. I ran, absolutely. Another yeah. story about college that I think is interesting is when I got there, I, I was determined to just free myself. It was the first time I remember I'm going to free myself from all this because I had always wanted to be a dancer. I used to watch ballet on public television mm -hmm. and I would just be swept away by the dancing. And, you know, so I, I when I went to college, I I was like, I'm going to take a ballet class. And I did. I, well, I signed up for a ballet class. And I bought like the shoes and the belt, you know, and the whole kit. And the first day of class, like I went to walk to the building and I looked in and I saw, you know, men and women, uh, young men and women, like getting ready to take their first ballet class. And I couldn't go in um, because the messages that I had gotten were so deep, you know, that, you know, not only do men not do this, not only do real men not do this, but black men certainly don't do this, um, that I turned around and I never went in. And I sometimes wonder like, oh my God, I could have been a, a prima ballerina, you know, by now, you know? So uh, yeah, I mean, that's just, that's kind of a tangent, but it just reminded me of that story, like of how, how deep it goes, you know? And I struggle with it still. Yeah. And the flip side of that, as a teeny tiny girl with pigtails, I was sent to ballet against my will. I really did not want to go. And my mother and my dad were just like, well, you should learn to be a little more graceful. And I was like, have you met me? I mean, even as a three-year-old, I was like, this is not going to take. And of course, you know, everyone's dancing to the right and I'm going to the left because I have right. no idea. What yeah. I, oh, I was much I better with a field hockey stick. Like yeah. stuff made sense later, but the dancing, I was, oh no, it was not good. <laughs> But I bet you were adorable, though. Just the, adorable. the hair won. I mean, the yeah. pigtails. I have Absolutely. seen the photos of the pigtails. <laughs> Absolutely. But again, you know, here I am. I'm a girl. And it made perfect sense. And I don't remember any little boys being in my ballet class. And this was also a number of years ago in D.C. So I don't think there ever would have been little boys in my ballet class just because yeah. of the era and the place and everything else and you know i might have also been the only brown kid i'm pretty sure i was the only brown kid yeah in my it's, ballet class it's weird because you know when i think about it it doesn't feel like it was that long ago you know things mm -hmm. are changing now and i think ch things have changed rapidly i mean certainly we have a very very long way to go uh, a very long way to go but it feels like you know if you're like gen x like i am that a lot of things have changed like pretty rapidly. And I do see, you know, little boys in, in ballet classes now, you know, not a lot, but I do see them, but it just feels like, you know, not that long ago, the rules were very clear and very strict about what you were 
for, for men, I think masculinity is more about what you're not allowed to do, mm -hmm. than what you are allowed to do. There's more restrictions than there are, you know, allowances. Um, you know, you can't do that. Don't sit like that. Don't stand like that. Don't talk like that. Don't feel like that. Don't um, cry. That's a don't big cry. one. Don't yeah. cry. Um, and I think that that was something that definitely my father grew up with. Um, and, you know, and, and I think for black men, it is doubly so than it is for, you know, just sort of men in general. It, you have to be the toughest, the strongest, the most masculine, you know, the most, uh, you know, you know, in a lot of cases, like just um, inaccessible. I think that it's one of those things that I, uh, and as I said, I want this book to be a part of that conversation that goes toward examining that and hopefully changing it. A lot of what you were taught by your parents came out of a place wanting to protect you. Yes. I think it's just really important to remember that different kinds of parents have to use different tools to protect their children. Yeah. And I'm not making excuses for decisions your parents made. I'm not making excuses for your dad's behavior or anything like that. But I think they did the best they could with what they had. Yeah. And I think that got very complicated for you because, I mean, that homophobia on top of the races. And you've got a story about where you're in high school and you go to a dance club with classmates and their parents are just the most appalling human beings on the planet. Yeah. Like no one will drive you home. You are a yeah. child. Yeah. And no one will drive you home because you're black. Yeah. And, and the children won't speak up for you because their parents are just very clear. The black kid is not getting in my car. I mean, we're not talking about Selma in 1958. Right. This was Ohio in what, 1985, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, but what's interesting, I think, about that story is that, you know, my mother did not get mad at them, at least not in front of me, mm -hmm. you know? She got mad at me. Mm -hmm. um, she wanted to put the fear of God in me to never put myself in that position again. You know, I think that that's kind of how my parents handled it. Like, as you say, they, they, they were trying to protect me. And so in my mind, it got kind of screwed up because it was like, I thought I was bad, you know. And my mother and I have talked about this like since, um, but I thought I was bad. But she was so angry uh, at the way that they had treated me that she just, she, her anger turned toward to me, you know, and don't you ever put yourself in that position again. In order to protect me, she made me feel horrible. <laughs> and that sounds backwards, but that's what happened, you know. And you're the only piece that she can control. She has absolutely no control over these strangers or their children right. and your classmates, but you're the piece where she can say, this will not happen again under my watch. And it's so upsetting in so many ways because there's no way for her to push back on a system right. that is bigger than her, bigger than her child, bigger than what happened to you. Right. Part of why I bring it up is there's a direct line. You can see this line where the shame is building in you as a person. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Starting Absolutely. with childhood. And there's not a moment where you're not being questioned and you internalized a lot of it. And it's so... You hurt my heart in a lot of ways as I was reading the book. I will say to people, though, that there's so much joy and goodness and humor and and silliness in a way to this book as well, because you're just being very honest. I mean, you've gone from a person who, no offense, Brian, you were lying in this book and you were recounting these lies like you were breathing. <laughs> I mean, dude, yeah. you can oh, yeah. lie. You oh, can yeah. lie. <laughs> oh, yeah. But oh, yeah. now we're in a place where you can see things differently and the shame isn't holding you, frankly, by the throat. I mean, there are moments where it's very clear that you are making decisions not based on facts. You're not making decisions. You're making decisions because you believe something to be true because it's been foisted off on you. I just wanted to, I mean, and I'm, I'm, and, and let's be real. Like I was, there were places in this book where I am absolutely horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Know, without a doubt. Horrible, without, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Um, and I don't, I do not excuse those. I think like part of the, um, you know, the thing about staying sober um, is that you gotta like, you have to acknowledge, you know, that you were horrible for whatever reason, you know, mm -hmm. you were horrible to people. 
And I manipulated people and I used people and I treated people as a means to an end. You know, I um, was, you know, all these things that I look back on and I, and I, you know, and because I acknowledge them now, I can openly sort of say like, I never want to be that person mm-hmm. again, you know, mm-hmm. and it's that, it is that desire that keeps me, you know, I think on, a, on the straight and narrow, you know, as much as I am, you know. Um, because, you know, I still lie. I still, you know, every once in a while, you know, I still, you know, I, I think we all do. I'm not about who I am anymore, you know, I hope. But this also comes back to the bigger point of the book, which is we have to be able to tell complete stories. And if we can't tell complete stories, then we're not dealing with the way we see masculinity. We're not dealing with the way we see gender or sexuality or any of these things that we're just continuing to sort of plow forward thinking, well, this is the way it has to go. And ultimately your story is really hopeful. I mean, you're on the other side of things. I mean, you're a teacher and you teach non introduction to nonfiction and journalism. So I'm kind of curious though, who's on your syllabus? Who is on my syllabus? Oh, that's really a good question. Like I'm trying to think of well, see, here's the thing. It's been a while since I've taught introduction to nonfiction and journalism. Like okay. that. right now, I'm teaching um, uh, the nonfiction workshop. I can't remember from like two years ago, like who was on my syllabus. Okay, who's um, on your syllabus now then? Like in this workshop that you're teaching? On this workshop, my students are on my syllabus because we all kind of like read each other's work um, and critique that work. But like, you know, I've been doing a lot of, uh, I've been giving them audio narratives to listen to um and uh, you know sort of non-fiction audio stories um there is i'll I'll just name one um that i think is really really good for non-fiction it's called uh man hubam and it's by uh sharon mashihi um is uh an iranian jewish woman who is um she is not she deals with the same sort of themes that I talk about. She is an Iranian Jewish woman whose mother, she and her mother do not agree on what being a woman is supposed to be. You know, her mother wants her to be feminine and rich and have a nice husband and, you know, have a nice house and have a nice, you know, BMW, you know, and Sharon Mashihi is just not that person. So she kind of, she does this great audio narrative where she kind of traps her mother on a boat <laughs> on a cruise ship. And it's all recorded um, to sort of like hash this, let's hash this out, you know, but she does a really great job of like storytelling, like throughout and explaining who she is, who her mother is, who her family is. And here we go. I'm going to trap my mother on this, on this boat and we're going to have it out. It's so good. Um, I super recommend it, but that, that's certainly one of the things that I put on my nonfiction syllabus um, for students to uh, to listen to. Okay, we know Gwendolyn Brooks and James Baldwin invited themselves into the book. They did. Who are some of your other literary influences? Well, I mean, if I if I feel like if I say Toni Morrison, it'll just sound you know uh, you know like everybody. But I mean, it's the truth. Um, you know, she was a genius. I really do pull inspiration from absolutely everything that I read, like recipes and, you know, uh, Bugs Bunny cartoons that I watch and, you know, um, uh, Stephen King and, you know, and, and, you know, there's an old book called Flowers in the Attic. You remember that old book? Oh, yes. Everyone, that that was required reading. Oh my God. You know, it was. And we were all reading it at like 10. We had no business reading that. (laughs) No business. It was terrible. So ever reading this, like, weird incest book oh. like, um you know but I really do like I because I do read multiple things at once you know and I really just pull things I think from mm-hmm. me. um so um just all of those little things I think um inform the way that I write uh, and I hope that all of them being involved helps me like mix things up a little bit so that the reader doesn't get bored the most important thing is the reader you know I mean I tell my students like Look, if you're writing about yourself, it's great that you want to get your feelings out. You want to maybe, you know, have some catharsis. You want to like, you know, get the air of these things out. But, you know, if you bore the reader, you're done. 
you know, um, and it's important to consider the fact that you're telling a story. You're not, in, you know, you're, this is not a therapy session. You know, you're telling a story and hopefully that story um, enlightens uh, or maybe makes the reader think, but, you know, it can't be such, such a sort of narcissistic endeavor that you're not, you're not thinking about the fact that somebody has to pick up your book and you want them to, to stay with it um, so that you can continue to tell your story and more stories in the future. I think there are people too who think of reading as a really passive act. And yeah. I don't actually think that's true. I think reading is one of the least passive things out. I mean, yes, in most cases you're sitting still, what have you, but mentally you are not sitting still when you're reading. You're connecting yeah. the dots between what you've read before or what you think you're missing. I mean, it is, in some cases, it can be an act of defiance. In some cases, it can be an act of education or entertainment or what have you, but it is not passive. Right. That is the last thing that reading is. And I just, it, this perception that it's kind of like, you know, you're sitting in a corner quietly. It's like, well, actually, right. no. <laughs> there's so, quite a lot happening between these so, ears right now. <laughs> right. It's more passive to watch TV. You know, mm -hmm. you're sort of sitting there watching TV and things are happening at you. Um, you know, I think because of the posture of reading, you're laying down, you're sitting in a chair, you're, you know, on a park bench, you know, people sort of confuse the, the position, the physical position of it with, like being passive. It's not, I don't, you know, um, I don't get that at all. It's one of the most active things you can do. I mean, it doesn't help you like, you know, get, build muscle, <laughs> but it's one of them. It's, I think it's a definitely an active thing you could do. It's exercise. What have you learned from your students over the years? Um, a lot, actually. I think the most, the biggest thing that I've kind of learned from my students is that there, there are going to be people after me. <laughs> You know, it, that sounds really dumb, but like, you know, you get it in your head and, you know, and, and you, you forget there's, there's like people coming after you, you know, that you can impart things to, um, you know, my students taught me about, uh, pronoun use, you know, I'm a gay man. And like, I didn't understand, you know, why some people want to be called they, and my students explained that to me in a way in which I got it, you know, and, and, and not just got it, but just like under, like really understood it. Um, and that I think can only happen from a younger person talking to an older person and thinking that, you know, and, 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 and the older person breaking down that idea of, well, I'm older than you, so I must know more. You know, that's a fallacy that we live by. Um, that because we're older, we know, we know better or we know more. You know, my students taught me about that. Um, so that's, I think, one of the biggest things um, that I've learned from my students. I learned that a lot of young people struggle with anxiety mm -hmm. more so than I ever knew. Um, you know, they have talked to me about their anxieties and the ways in which they grew up. And also I've learned that some things never change, you know. <laughs> Um, and it's always rewarding. Um, it's always refreshing to, to talk to them and see what they, you know, want to do with their lives and not just my younger students, you know, my older students as well. I have, you know, students who are older than me and I, you know, definitely have learned a lot about writing and about life, like from them as well. So, um, it's great to be a teacher. I really, really enjoy it. And writing is an act of connection. I mean, reading is an act of connection. It's, it's a way of stepping outside of who you are. I think you make a really important point about Punch Me Up to the Gods in that there are universal elements to your story. I've been to Ohio once. No, <laughs> twice. Twice. Once on business and once to visit cousins. Yeah. But there was not a moment that I wasn't connected to your narrative. And I think this is a really important point to make. I mean, we, you and I grew up very differently. We have different stories now. But that act of connection, because you told the truth about your story and you yeah. sat with the shame and you sat with the anxiety and the fact that we can even have conversations now about anxiety. When you and I were growing up, no one had language for any of this. I mean, you've even come out and said, well, I think my dad actually had an anxiety disorder. Yeah, I think, was, I think he did. And especially for black men like your dad, we did not have that. We didn't have that language really for anyone, but we certainly did not have it for men like your father. No, you know, I think that my father suffered from an anxiety disorder. I think he also suffered from a depression, a depression disorder. Um, you know, he would 
go into the bedroom and be there for days. And I remember other family members saying that he was lazy. Right. And I just thought that that's what he was. You know, nobody was talking about his mental health. You know, a, a lot of people read this book and they sort of like they cast my father as the villain, you yeah. know, in this book. But I don't see it that way at all. You know, he was a man who was I mean, he did horrible things, but like he was a man who was dealing with his own, you know, mental health issues. Um, he was afraid. He was anxious and he was depressed. Um, and as you say, we didn't have language for any of that back then. Again, and it doesn't feel like it was that long ago. Right. Now we're talking about it all the time, you know, it seems. Uh, and, you know, we can we can stand to talk about it more, you know, in my opinion. But, you know, he was, I look back now and, you know, I have my issues with anxiety and depression. And I'm like, well, I, I think I come by it honestly because I think my father suffered from those things for most of his life. And he himself came from an extremely violent and abusive situation. Um, and so now I just kind of understand him better. You know, um, people ask me if I forgive him and I, and I, and I, I say to myself, like some days I do, you know, I think it's po perfectly possible to forgive people some days and then not forgive them the next day, you know, particularly if they're, if they're no longer with us, you know, um, but he was dealing definitely with his own stuff. And I get that now. I didn't get it then. Yeah, and I think aiming for canonization, if you're just an average person, like most of us, it's, <laughs> it's not that interesting. <laughs> it's really not. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, and again, I, and I know I mentioned this earlier in this conversation, but this idea that we need to be able to talk about all of the facets of messy lives yeah. and that respectability politics is not good for anyone. Right. And pretending that this stuff doesn't happen or that we don't make bad decisions or that, you know, we don't learn to lie. I mean, all of this stuff, it's really important the way you pull it together and give it a context and give it life. I mean, you're talking and at one, you were sort of interspersing these vignettes about a little boy traveling with his dad on the bus. He's what, a toddler? I mean, he seems he's very a, tiny. Yeah, I, he's I don't, a very tiny. He's a, I don't know what age children are. Like that's Yeah, like, I don't either. <laughs> He's a he's definitely he's not like making sentences yet, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. like he's very he's a very small boy who has just learned to walk. Um, so I don't know how old that is, maybe one, you know, very it's young, small. Yeah, it's very small, small boy. And here's the thing. You're writing this, what, 20, 30 years after you were that tiny boy? 40 years? Well, I mean, maybe, a lot longer, many, right? Many, many okay. years after that. <laughs> but I only raise it because, again, like we're seeing these cycles. Yeah, we're seeing these cycles and we're repeating ourselves and we're still having these sort of limiting conversations again about masculinity and what yeah. it means and, and gender and sexuality and all these things where it's we keep wanting in a way to put ourselves in a box as a culture and a society. Yeah. And I don't think that's how this works. But what's it like for you as the writer to see all of this on the page? To, to my own work, yep. talking about mm -hmm. it, or just people talking about it in general. Mm -mm. Um, your own work, your own story. I, I mean, every once in a while, I'll pick up my own book and try mm -hmm. to read it, and I just immediately put it down. It's still hard for me to read in places. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels like, um, you know, I I think I have sort of unconsciously like blocked it a little bit. Like just I just put it out there and let it be its own thing. You know. It's like I, you know, gave birth and I gave it up, you know, mm -hmm. um, there were, there were places, you know, I, I can tell you that before publication, I got really, really, really nervous. Um, and there were nights that I sat up in bed and I was like, I really want to call this off. I shouldn't have done this, um, you know, to have all that stuff out there, but, you know, to see what has happened in the aftermath that people are reading it and, and maybe my story um is resonating with people i've had you know it's been so great like i think yesterday or a couple days ago i had a, i did a podcast with two um heterosexual black men um who completely understood what i was talking about that's awesome identified my own brother as a matter of fact reached out to me after the book and said he was also dealing with the same things like when he was growing up 
so it's gratifying for me to see that men of all all kinds you know all backgrounds mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know are having this discussion and i think the discussion is is just beginning you know i think that we are just at the very 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 beginning of this discussion you know right now i you know i watched rathaniel the other night with um gerard carmichael and he's starting this discussion and then i see lil nas x you know out there out and proud and like he's like now talking about this discussion so you know it is something that's being brought up now it's no longer something that's hidden people know it's there and you know the question becomes like how are we going to deal with it how are we going to start you know to educate our little boys about what it means to be you know a boy in this world or what it means to be a girl in this world um and uh, i hope that those discussions continue along the right the right path so what's next for you oh boy i'm writing again um I turned in a couple of uh, chapters to my agent um, um, a few days ago, and she was like, okay, keep going, you know? Um, so there's that. Um, I am, I have a film agent now. Um, so I have been talking to uh, movie people, which has been very exciting. Um, and, you know, just teaching, like, which, um, you know, I love to do. Um, yeah, as a writer, you got to, you know, you got to keep a check coming in. You never know, you know, um, but, but fortunately I really enjoy teaching. So, uh, you know, if, if I got to work a steady job, you know, I would, I love that the the fact that that's it, you know, because I get to write and I get to talk about writing all the time and I get to read other people's writing all the time. And it's just wonderful. And it brings me back to punch me up to the gods being a very hopeful story. I think it is, you know, and I I do think that that's the impression that people get, you know, there are people who sort of focus on the negative parts. I've I've talked to them and, and I'm like, but no, you know, I I get it. You know, I I think it's more of a, you know, nobody's life is all, you know, flowers and, and, and sex and, and money, you know, Oh God, I wish it was. Um, But, you know, but in the end, I, I really hope that people get the message of, of the book um, and, and, and maybe it changes their view on certain things or causes them to ask questions about certain things or maybe look at their own life or maybe somebody they love um, in a different way. So, yeah. You know, I just really want to be clear that Punch Me Up to the Gods does end on a really hopeful note. But I think there's a larger conversation that we still need to have. And this this goes back to not just what you were saying about gender a second ago, but also mental health in black and brown communities. We're yeah. not, we need to keep having these conversations. Absolutely. You know, I, it's, it's, I think black and brown communities, like I think that mental health or seeking mental health treatment is still seen as some sort of like weakness um, or that there's something wrong with you, toughen up. You know, um, this is the world, it's a horrible place, and you got to be tough to tough enough to do it. And if you are struggling with mental health issues, that means that you are weak um, or somehow deficient, you know. Um, and I think that in Black and Brown communities, mental health is a serious issue. You know, it goes hand in hand with being a Black or Brown person and just living in this country which I think many of us can agree has its problems with race. So you can't live in a, in a, um, you know, a society that is, that is set up to debase you and not have, um, you know, mental health problems. So, you know, I just want to encourage, you know, black and brown communities to go and seek help for your anxiety, your depression, your, you know, um, it's not you being weak, you know, it, there are things that make you that are making you feel this way, and I do want to uh, impress upon people that if they know somebody um, who is struggling, to to not shame them about it, um, but to maybe get them to try to help get them the help that they need. And I think a lot of folks are going to be helped by Punch Me Up to the Gods. There's a lot of very, very honest, open, beautiful prose that is occasionally also very funny. Yes. And having those moments to breathe and process what you've just read, I think is really important. 
So I'm really looking forward to lots of folks discovering Punch Me Up to the Gods this summer. Let's take it to the beach. Seriously, take this book to the beach. Take it on take the bus. Take me to the beach. Take oh. me to the beach. Okay, there's that too. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Broom, thank you so much for joining us. Punch Me Out to the Punch Me Up to the Gods is out in paperback now. Thank you, Mia. Hello, readers. Welcome to another TBR Top Off, where we recommend books to pick up when you come in for your copy of Punch Me Up to the Gods. My name is Becky, and I am coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I am joined with my ever-present book buddy, Mark. Hello. (laughs) So, um, so yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with my recommendation. Uh, So, with this book, uh, honestly, the first thing that came to mind is a book that just came out recently. It's by one of my favorite people ever, Billy Porter. Uh, This is his memoir. It's called Unprotected, and... Oh, it, it punches you in the gut, but it also makes you laugh out loud. This is just an incredible book. It, it basically, it is a memoir that he wrote and it just shares about his growing up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, at the age of five, he, his family put him into a, into therapy to fix his effeminacy. And it's just, it's heartbreaking, uh, honestly, the way that he grew up. He was sexually abused by his stepfather, um, just picked on at school. He never fit in um, as a kid. And when you just think of that, but then you see what he has become now, ah, uh, the miracles that, that occurred. And, um, and this book is, it tells you everything um, about the, the bad beginning to the incredible, you know, where he is now. Um, I fell in love with Billy Porter uh, when he um, created the the role of Lola in Kinky Boots, and uh, and he won the Drama Desk Award and the Tony Award, and just really he should get every award. He's fantastic. <laughs> so, um, but now of course, if you are familiar with him, you've uh, been watching him on Pose, and um, and honestly, I just I feel like the sky's the limit for where he'll go. So. Um, if you just want to get a taste of a little bit more to know a little bit of, of, about his growing up um, and and just kind of where he came from and how he got to where he is now, Unprotected is a fantastic memoir. Really just talks about how important it is to continue to believe in yourself regardless of what you're going through. So, Mark, what do you have? Ooh, <laughs> great pick, Becky. Oh, thank you. Oh. He is a wonder. He is. <laughs> uh, so I chose a book that I think folds in really nicely and can live on the same shelf as Punch Me Up to the Gods and probably Billy Porter's Ooh. memoir. And it's a book called How We Fight for Our Lives by Saeed Jones. This is a memoir slash social science commentary. Um, it is mainly a coming of age story that is written in this insanely beautiful poetic language and it is about a young man growing up in the south uh, as a gay black kid and the struggles that that really entails in any situation uh, is relatable to a lot of people in the world right now Um, but this one in particular just really hit home for me Um, it's got these really resonant themes of power who holds power what you do with that power as well as the power of tenderness and how you can wield that as well. Um, Being a gentle soul in a hard scrabble world is tough. And I think Saeed Jones really beautifully demonstrates that you can take that power and use it for something important. And he certainly has with this book. Um, I recommend it wholeheartedly. I think it's lovely. So please check out How We Fight For Our Lives by Saeed Jones. And that, oh, and one more thing. His mother is amazing. (laughs) Oh my gosh, I love his mother so much. The introduction alone for the first two lines, you should be hooked. Okay, so that is all we have for today. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening and watching Port Over. Um, Please make sure to rate and subscribe us and give us some support. You can follow us at Barnes & Noble, and you can follow our home store at BN Westchester. My name is Mark. My name is Becky. Thanks so much, everybody. Happy reading. Bye. Board Over is a Barnes & Noble production. The show is available on Apple, Spotify, and Stitcher. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to podcasts.